Welcome everyone. Uh, so for this uh, keynote session, uh, I just want to remind you that you can ask a question to the slido.com uh, website with this uh, uh, topic. Um, so uh, today we have the chance to have uh, the actual CTO of Earth Studio, also known as the Shiny Guys. Uh, he will talk to us about the conflict or the challenge between interactivity and productivity. Uh, please welcome George Chang. Good morning. Can you guys hear me OK? Um, I titled this talk, Shiny's Holy Grail, uh, because this challenge of interactivity with reproducibility is something that um, has been uh, a quite a big challenge for us for a long time. And to be honest, I was very excited to be uh, given the chance to speak at USAR. And I chose this topic before we actually knew how to solve the problem. So it was a little bit of an aspirational topic, uh, hoping that if I committed to the topic, that we would indeed solve the problem by the time the uh, talk came around. I do not recommend this approach in hindsight. Uh, this was very close to a disaster, but I think it uh, actually worked out pretty well. And I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. So hopefully, by this point, most of you know that Shiny is a way to build interactive web apps in R. And I really want to focus on the interactive part of that. Interactivity is really great because it allows users to quickly explore different parameter values and uh, other aspects of analyses. And when you can explore them through an interactive user interface, the uh, speed of iteration uh, gives you much faster and more visceral feedback. And that's very valuable in a lot of cases. This is especially important when you're collaborating with people that don't have our experience. They can't run a script that you send them. To be able to give them a user interface that's interactive is extremely powerful. So this is hopefully the least impressive Shiny app you're going to see during your time here. Um, this app I chose to uh, showcase here because the code is going to fit within my slides while uh, you people in back are able to see them. Uh, this app is pulling data from the CRAN logs server. And you can type in the name of a package at the top here, and it will show you uh, some information about how many downloads that package has received from our CRAN servers. So in this case, the SP package, it has a median down daily download rate of uh, 68, 6,900 downloads. You can see. This plot here is not a direct plot of the download numbers per day, but a seven-day rolling average. And if, I, uh, if the user goes into the package name field and changes that package name to SF, now you can see uh, a direct comparison to how, that, uh, how the SF package compares in download count. And that interactivity is great. But in order to give you that uh, interactivity, we've lost something really important. Um, compared to traditional R scripts or R markdown reports, we've really taken a step back in terms of reproducibility. Number one, when you're looking at the output of particularly a complex Shiny app with a lot of tabs and things like that, there's not really an easy way to even save the outputs uh, for archival purposes or to email them or something like that. Whereas if you have a report or a script, it's really easy to come up with a PDF or HTML document. And when you even if you have the source code for a Shiny app, reproducing that analysis is inconvenient. It's not enough to have the code. You also have to go through the manual steps to put the app in the same state as it was uh, when you did your original analysis. And that, that defeats the very purpose of reproducibility because it introduces the possibility for error. Um, Shiny does have this bookmarkable state feature, but that kind of interferes with my narrative right now about Shiny not being great. So uh, we're, we're not going to pay attention to that today, but just know that that's a thing. And uh, when you're not in this interactive mode, when you've already landed on the parameters and the outputs that you care about, then uh, examining the source code is harder uh, for a Shiny app than it is for a traditional R script. There's more uh, visual noise that has to do with Shiny and interactivity that you don't want to deal with when you're just trying to understand what, is, what are the methods that were used to, uh, to come up with this analysis. 
So the goal for us today is how can we uh, bring these two things together? How can we uh, bridge this gap between interactivity and reproducibility? And the, the particular vector we're going to focus on today is, number one, we're going to have a user use the interactive app until they find their interesting results. So this is no different than how you use Shiny today. But then as a second step, to offer them a button or some kind of UI gesture that will let them view or download a reproducible artifact out of the choices that they've made in that app. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of different ways you could imagine interactivity and reproducibility sort of coming together. Uh, maybe some people in this room who are uh, very uh, avid Shiny users have had their own take on this, and uh, I'd love to hear about them. But th this is the particular tack that we're going to take today. Now, I just want to talk about some of the scenarios where people really, really want this kind of functionality. And probably the most vocal users have been from pharma, from my experience. Um, in, in drug development and in clinical, uh, clinical trials, workflows uh, really they, they get a tremendous benefit from the interactivity, but at the end of the day, the reproducibility is non-negotiable. Um, it is really, really important to them. So they have worked very hard uh, all inventing their own solutions to this problem. Uh, in teaching also, teaching is a huge use of Shiny. People love using Shiny to have interactive applets for teaching statistical concepts. And it would be really great if there was uh, an automated way to be able to display not only uh, an, an intuitive display of some concept, but to have the corresponding R code right next to it so that a student could grab that code and apply it to their own R code right away. And finally, you can definitely imagine a lot of uh, gadgets or RStudio add-ins where you use Shiny to create a user interface to enhance your own workflow, to enhance your own work with R. For example, um, uh, you know, there, people have done visual ggplot2 builders where you have more of a, a UI approach to, to um, expressing a grammar of graphics plot and at the end of it, being able to turn that into code that gets inserted into your script. So just to focus for a moment on this notion of reproducible artifacts, what are we talking about? What is going to be viewed or downloaded when you're done with your um, analysis? So the simplest way uh, to imagine this is just a simple R snippet directly in the browser. So without leaving the Shiny app, you have a button that says view the code, and then you see something like this that you can copy and paste. Uh, this is the IC app that was one of the winners of the uh, Shiny um, contest from uh, earlier this year. Another way you could imagine it is not to view the code in a browser, but to download a standalone RMD or .r file so that the user can edit it and uh, you know, do their own uh, customizations. And the third way takes that second way a step further. Instead of just downloading an RMD or a .r file, downloading a zip bundle that includes not only that source code, but uh, any data or supporting files that are necessary for that source code to successfully run. And uh, why not also the rendered results of running that source code? So in this case, this report.pdf. And we'd like to make all of this very easy. So this is uh, that same app again, but this time we have a button at the bottom that says download as report. So now that we've selected what package we're interested in and we see these results and we want to make something reproducible out of this, we click that button and it creates a zip file that when you open it has these contents. There's a CSV that contains the, the raw data, um, a report.pdf, which has the same outputs that you see here, and, uh, and report.rmd. Before we continue, I want to define a couple of terms that's going to help us as we uh, try to make sense of this problem and, and how to solve it. Domain logic, I'm defining as the essential analysis that our app embodies. So this is the actual R code that performs the analysis. Um, in software engineering, we usually call this uh, business logic, but somehow in this setting, it seems a little gauche to call it uh, business logic. So we'll call it domain logic. And um, everything that's not domain logic, that's not this essential analysis code, we're going to call reactive structure. So this is the stuff that relates to Shiny and interactivity and not to the actual analysis that's being performed. The act of creating a Shiny app generally starts with, you know, you've done some analysis in regular R, and then you add reactive structure to make that code interactive. And what we want to do today is to have that Shiny app code, and we're going to move in the other direction. We're going to uh, 
extract the domain logic back out of that shiny code and uh, end up with something reproducible. Just to give you an illustration of what that looks like, this is the code for that um, CRAN downloads thing that you saw. Uh, but this is not a shiny app. This is just a regular R script. And we're going to spend a lot of time uh, with this code. So uh, it, it, it's worth taking a second to understand how this works. So the first uh, expression there downloads. It uh, calls this CRAN logs package to retrieve the downloads for whatever package, in this case, ggplot2, uh, over the last year. That returns a data frame. The next line where we calculate downloads rolling takes that data frame and uses Zoo to apply a uh, seven-day um, rolling average on those download counts. And then finally, we just create a ggplot out of the results there. Now, to convert this R script to Shiny involves introducing these keywords. Reactive, we use reactive to wrap these different expressions. And that is what allows Shiny to take control of those expressions and make them interactive. Shiny decides when these things need to run and when they don't. And the same thing with this output at the bottom. So if you're not too familiar with Shiny, this is about as far as we're going to go with Shiny app coding. But um, the one other thing we need to do is this is currently hard coded to ggplot2. And uh, we need to make that respect whatever uh, value the user types in. So ggplot2 changes to input packages. That's a shiny convention for accessing user input. And everywhere we want to read from one of these reactive objects, we have to insert parentheses. So downloads, instead of being a variable, you call it like a function. And that concludes the shiny lesson for the day. Uh, once we've done those two steps, we now have a shiny app. This is uh, the vast majority of this shiny app's code. So now the big question is, how do we go the other way? How do we undo these things that we've done and end up back where we started with this uh, straight line code, with the exception that that input dollar package has now been replaced by whatever the user typed in? So this really summarizes what the goal is. And uh, this has been a goal we've known about for a long time, but we have not really understood how to uh, solve this in a satisfying way. So over the years, there have really been three approaches that I'm aware of that we've taken, different people in the Shiny community have taken, and that um, experiments that we've done. And the first and most obvious approach to doing this is just copying and pasting. So we need our domain logic in these two different ways, in interactivity and in a reproducible form. Let's just make two copies, right? We built a Shiny app. We're going to copy the logic out and also make an R markdown report. And now we have two copies. Now, I don't want to, um, I'm not trying to be pejorative here. That, that is actually a totally valid approach because it's very easy to understand. Uh, it's a very literal approach to the problem. And the reproducible code that you generate is written by hand, so it can be uh, you know, perfectly handcrafted to be exactly the right kind of reproducible code that you want. Now, the downside, of course, is, well, now you've got two copies of your logic to keep in sync. And that is um, not only tedious, but it is a potential source of errors. And um, I don't want to go too far into this, but there are also classes of Shiny apps where this is not going to work because they're very dynamic. And they, they create new logic on the fly. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish when you are hard coding your reproducible script into an R markdown. The second approach, which uh, really took me by surprise last year, I heard about this at R Pharma. Um, and th this package called Script Gloss, which is written by Doug Kalkoff, who um, uh, is from Roche Genentech. Uh, they have an approach in Script Gloss where they automatically generate scripts from a Shiny app uh, just using static analysis and heuristics, meaning it looks at the text of your Shiny app in order to uh, try to reverse engineer what parts need to go into a reproducible script and which don't. And I, I was, frankly, a little bit shocked that this worked at all. Um, so it was, it was a very impressive piece of work. The plus side is it's very, very easy to add this to your app. Uh, there are really few knobs that you can even turn. So uh, it, it basically works or it doesn't. Now, the unfortunate part is that sometimes it doesn't work, that there are apps that uh, simply do not work with this approach that they took. Uh, and I'm going to go into details. And the other thing is that even uh, when it does work, um, the source code that's generated from this tool, uh, it, it doesn't look like exactly like the code that a human would write. It, you can still see a lot of shiny uh, artifacts hanging off of it. Uh, so it, it, it looks a little bit strange, so I'd say it's not, it's not camera ready. 
The third approach um, is to do this programmatically. Um, we're going to go into a lot more about what this means, but it's to use metaprogramming techniques uh, to write code that we're going to write our logic once, and it will simultaneously serve both of these purposes. It'll execute interactively and also be capable of exporting static code. And the plus sides are this kind of code is almost camera ready. It's not quite as good currently as if you were to handwrite this code, but it uh, looks pretty good, and we have some ideas of how to make it better. So the code quality is pretty good, um, and it's an extremely flexible approach. So um, as far as I can tell, any kind of shiny app that you write, it should be able to handle. The downside is uh, there's a high enough learning curve that I could do a 45-minute talk about this topic. So um, it, it is not nothing. And if you have an existing app, you will have to make changes to that app to make it fit into this approach. So with that said, I am really thrilled to announce this new package called Shiny Meta that um, I made public, uh, I think, last night, actually, on GitHub. This is work that uh, Carson Sievert and myself um, have been working on for the past few months. Um, you may know Carson from his work with the uh, Plotly package. Uh, he's a member of the Shiny team now and has been doing uh, great work on this project. So Shiny Meta, uh, I need to give this disclaimer that this package is experimental. And usually, uh, I'll often give a, discla a disclaimer like this, but what I really mean is, hey, there might be bugs. Um, this really is experimental. Um, it, uh, number one, we have a really excellent uh, QA team on the Shiny team. They have not even seen this package yet. So uh, Shalu Tawari would like you to know that she, has, uh, she makes no claims about the quality of this, app, uh, of this uh, package. Uh, the second thing is that the function API may still be evolving. I really try not to do this by the time I do a public talk about something, but in this particular case, um, it, this really has been an interesting package to write, and I say that in the worst way. Um, when we started working on this, it, it kind of seemed like it would be a hard problem, but not that hard, and I have been shocked at the emotional roller coaster it's been as we've been developing this. Uh, there have been times when we thought that we were done, and then the next day I wake up to Carson showing me a code sample that makes me question everything I believe in. So um, I saw this wonderful quote while I was in the process of um, trying to, to finalize this package. Scientists build to learn. Engineers learn to build. Um, and I really thought that this, this felt so apropos. Especially for me, I'm so used to fully knowing what I'm trying to build before I even write a single line of code, and this was totally the opposite. So after reading this, I realized this was really my first time coding like a scientist. And um, I gotta say, I didn't care for it. <laughs> so let's talk about how to use Shiny Meta. Um, th this will be the remainder of the talk. It, number one, the first step is that you, the app author, you are gonna identify what parts of your app uh, are the domain logic? What parts uh, represent the essential uh, analysis code? The second step is within that domain logic, you need to identify all the places where you're reading reactive values or reading reactive expressions. The third step is uh, you're, now that you have your domain logic kind of separated out, you have to decide which particular pieces of domain logic you want to expose to the user. And then finally, some kind of button or widget or something in your app so that the user can actually tell you, hey, I want to see code now or I want to download a bundle now. And, uh, and then you can, you can make that appear. So those are the four steps, and we are going to go through them uh, in some detail. Now, we're going to keep coming back to this slide, and it's really important, so I've marked it with, uh, with this colored bar at the bottom, so when you see that colored bar, you know that we are back on this part of the outline. So let's drill down on this first uh, and probably most important step. We need to identify which parts of our app are the actual domain logic as opposed to everything else. And in order to solve this, Shiny Meta introduces a new family of reactive objects, and that's a pretty big step for us. So, Let's talk about why the existing reactive objects don't work for this purpose. Uh, this, again, is the same code that we've been looking at. We've got this downloads reactive that uh, runs CRAN downloads. And you call downloads like a function in order to retrieve the current data set. That's how Shiny works. Once you've called that once, the result is cached uh, until uh, input package changes. So, that's what reactive expressions are for. They know when they need to update, and they know when they don't need to. 
So this works great. It's one of, I'm, I'm really proud of the way uh, this reactivity stuff works in Shiny, but uh, there is no way for us to extract the logic out of this, the domain logic. So instead, we've introduced this meta reactive function, and you will use this instead of the regular reactive. And for the most part, it does everything precisely the same way a regular reactive does. But it has this one additional feature that it can give you its own source code at runtime. And you do that by, uh, well, I'm going to demonstrate doing that by calling with meta mode and giving it downloads. And uh, the result is the same code that you passed in. Uh, we're going to come back to this with meta mode. This is not what you're actually going to use, but it's what, what I'm going to use to demonstrate. Um, OK. And just to be explicit about this, the rule is anything inside of a meta reactive is considered domain logic. So your domain logic is going to go inside a meta reactive, and anything inside of a meta reactive is considered domain logic. Um, so that's how we take reactives and make them able to serve up their own code. Uh, we have similar, object, uh, similar new functions that correspond with reactive observers and reactive outputs. Uh, so you can see on the right these different um, functions that you use in, instead of the original ones. Now, for each one of these, there is a two variant, um, which give you more control over uh, the semantics here. So uh, by way of demonstrating that, this meta reactive, I, I've now changed it slightly. I've added this one line rec input package. Um, if you're a Shiny user, uh, hopefully you know that rec is a way of telling Shiny that I require this value to be present in order to proceed. If, it, if that value is not present, then I'm going to stop execution. And that is really important for reactivity, so it doesn't, uh, for interactivity, so that it doesn't try to proceed uh, when it doesn't have the values that it needs. But when you're ready to create a reproducible artifact, that's not really relevant code. We want to remove that, and that really counts as shiny structure. So, um, yeah, right there. So both those recs, uh, that's code that we don't want to appear in the, in the final output. So what we can do is instead of using meta reactive, we use meta reactive two. And we wrap the part of the code that we actually care about for reproducibility with meta expert. And now, uh, when we call with meta mode dataset, the output that we get uh, does not include the part that we excluded from meta expert. So, just to recap what that looks like with our, this is our original Shiny app before we've done anything with Shiny meta. First, we replace the uh, meta reactives with. Uh, sorry, the reactives with meta reactives, and meta, uh, we use meta render to wrap the render plot. Uh, this syntax is a little weird. Sorry, you'll get used to it. Um, and uh, you can find all the details about how to do this in the documentation. So that concludes the first step. We've identified now what parts of our code are domain logic by using these new meta reactive functions. Now the second step is within each of those meta reactives, we need to identify the parts that need to be replaced with static values and static code because they're reactive in and of themselves. In this example, um, this, is the, this is the code that we just looked at. One of the problems with the output code here is that it has input dollar package in the output code. And that's not code that we want to send to someone else. That's not code that we want to execute in a new R session, because input is a shiny artifact, and that's not going to be present when you're rendering an R markdown or running a, an R script. So we don't want input dollar package here. We want the value of input dollar package. And uh, the way we do that is with the bang bang operator. So in our original code, we put bang bang, and the resulting code that's generated contains the value instead of the expression. So that is one use of bang bang, to take uh, reactive values and replace them with their actual, or uh, reactive value expressions and replace them with their actual values. There's a second equally important um, use for bang bang in the context of shiny meta, which is um, to be able to inline other meta reactive objects. So in this case, this is what we just did. We added bang bang to input package. Now let's introduce the second meta reactive, which is downloads rolling. So it calls downloads as the first thing that it does here. And the code that's generated contains downloads. 
But that's not really what we want. That's not the code that we want to end up in our script because downloads isn't a function in the final script, right? There is no downloads anything. So if we insert bang bang here right before the call to downloads, what will happen is in the code that's generated, downloads will be expanded into the actual code expression that is inside of the downloads meta reactive. So that code goes from saying downloads to the actual code behind downloads. And now this is code that I can copy and paste into a, an R session and it'll work. Um, I kind of made it run off the screen on purpose. This code looks terrible, and we will come back to uh, how we're going to address that. So this is what uh, our Shiny app looks like uh, so far. We've turned the reactives into meta-reactives, and now we add the bang-bangs, and, and that's it. Now we have a uh, complete set of domain logic that's ready to be exported. The next step is to actually um, identify which pieces of domain logic are worthy of being exported to the user at any particular time. What we've seen so far is when we want to get the code out of a meta reactive, we use this with meta mode function. And as I said before, this is really just for demo purposes. Um, in most cases, we're going to use this other function called expand chain. And the way to explain it is really um, I think the best way is to show you what's not good about with meta mode in order to explain what's good about uh, expand chain. The way with meta mode works, as I've just described, is whenever you see bang bang in uh, apply bang bang applied to a reactive input or reactive value, uh, the value is inlined into the expression. And whenever bang bang is applied to a meta reactive read operation, the code is inlined in, into the expression. Expand chain works the same way with respect to uh, reactive inputs, but in the second case, when you apply bang bang to a meta reactive read, it doesn't uh, inline the code, it introduces a new variable. And I'll show you um, what that means. In our example app that we've been working with, our output reads downloads rolling, and downloads rolling reads downloads. So we have this uh, sort of uh, set of dependencies that are implicit here. And when we use with meta mode to generate the, the uh, plot output, it starts out like this. We have a bang bang downloads rolling. So what does with meta mode do? It expands that into the full source code with, uh, of downloads rolling. And downloads rolling contains uh, a reference to downloads with the bang bang. So what happens? That gets expanded into uh, the code for downloads. Now. I don't know about you, but I don't write code that looks like that. Um, hopefully, uh, no, nobody here is writing code that looks like this. Uh, and yet, this is the code that's generated naively out of with meta mode. Now, this code works. We could copy and paste it. But the whole point of this exercise was to make the code easier to understand. And we've definitely lost that somewhere along the way. And this is with a Shiny app that's so simple it could fit on a single slide. You can imagine what would happen if you, uh, you know, imagine some of the Shiny apps that you've seen and try to apply the same technique. So this is sort of a dead end. Uh, it's not going to work. And that's where expand chain comes in. Um, sorry, just a footnote. I expand chain, this was like a total revelation to me, uh, literally one week ago today. Um, we had a very different way of working around this problem before. That was so awful in every way, and I really felt bad about coming here with that being the best that we could do. Uh, and I am so happy to be able to present to you this uh, much more satisfying solution called Expand Chain. Um, so Expand Chain, we're going to start from the same place. We have this output plot, and it calls downloads rolling. But instead of expanding downloads rolling in place, what expand chain does is it turns it into a variable and inserts the definition for that variable above the code that needs it. The next step is uh, as, it's, as it's introducing that new code, it notices, oh, this also calls a meta reactive downloads, and it's going to perform that same operation. So you can see that um, as it delves further and further into your chain of dependencies, we grow a chain upward of variables that need to be declared. And uh, I can't tell you 
how happy this makes me compared to the abomination of things that we were doing before. Um, so th this is um, a very general approach that I think uh, works really well. And there's one even more important reason why we need to take this approach instead of with meta. Uh, and that is, consider if you have multiple meta objects, um, you have multiple outputs that you want to output as part of the same script, and they depend on a lot of the same uh, meta reactives. You have these complex graphs of dependencies, which if you've done a fair amount of Shiny, I'm sure you have these kinds of complex uh, interdependencies in your app. It's what Shiny was uh, de uh, designed for. And Expand Chain is able to turn all those dependencies into the correct linear set of variable declarations uh, that will give you the correct results. So um, once again, uh, to beat our poor straw man of with meta mode one more time, uh, with meta mode, if we were to output this second output uh, called summary, um, and it was based on downloads, you can see here highlighted in, uh, in, I think, red, that the same code has now been duplicated in two places in our script. And there is no reason for that other than just the way with meta mode works. And you can imagine if this logic that was duplicated involved some kind of random sampling, you would actually get the wrong results. This is not just a matter of style. It would actually be incorrect. So um, the beautiful thing is that with expand chain, if you tell it about all the things that you're interested in at the same time, it will just emit the minimal set of variables necessary to get the right results. So in this case, we add output summary. Output summary's uh, dependencies are already satisfied. So the only new code is this one, uh, one line summary. Finally, once we have generated that code, we have that code in our hand, uh, we need a way to present it to the user. And uh, as I alluded to before, there are several ways that we can do that. Uh, probably the simplest way is if you have a single output um, that you want to be able to expose the code for. Uh, let's say we have one plot in our app, and we want to add a, a button to download the source code for that plot. There's this output code button function that's part of Shiny Meta that adds this frame around your output and has a show code button. So you can imagine uh, you know, a large and complex app where every output has one of these buttons uh, surrounding it. And when you click that button, um, then you can do any number of things, but probably the most common is that you're going to uh, display it with this function called display code modal. And this uses the Shiny Ace widget to, uh, to display the source code. You can't edit it. Uh, that'd be a really bad idea, but you can copy it using this button at the bottom. Now, instead of displaying it inline, as we discussed before, you could also choose to have users download uh, our, our scripts or RMD reports, um, or you could have them build dynamically, uh, you could have them download dynamically built zip bundles. So in this example, um, oh, I actually never showed you the report. Um, dare I exit? Chrome in this French keyboard. Um. Okay. So this is what a generated report from that example app looks like. Um, and in order to in order to make that available from my app. First, I need to write a report.rmd template that provides the, the formatting and the sort of metadata that I want for my app. There are a lot of choices I can make with an RMD. And all I have to do is any parts of that report that need to be customized at runtime, such as the package name, we don't know that in advance, right, or the source code, um, we just insert variables surrounded by double uh, curly quotes. No, th those aren't curly quotes. Those are curly braces. Sorry, it takes a lot of energy to stand up here looking at all of you. There's not much brain power left for thinking. Um, uh, and then uh, now that we have that report.rmd template, we can call this function that comes with um, a shiny meta called build rmd template. And uh, there are just a few arguments. You tell it where your template file lives. You tell it uh, if there are any additional files that you choose to include in the zip bundle, in this case, I want to include some data. So I say uh, data.csv equals and then a file path, and it will include that file in the bundle named data.csv. And then the vars equals list gives me uh, the ability to tell our markdown what to put in those curly uh, braced sections of the RMD template. 
So in this case, we need to tell it the package name, and we need to give it the code that we generated using expand chain. Uh, and that's all you need to do with that one uh, function call. It will build the report for you. It will, it will render it to a PDF. It will create the zip file and offer it as a download to the user. So just to recap, these four steps using Shiny Meta. Number one, we're going to identify the domain logic in the app code. Number two, oh, we're going to do that by using Meta Reactive and that family of functions. Number two, we're going to use Bang Bang in a fairly mechanical way. Everywhere you see a reactive value being read or you see a reactive expression being called, uh, you'll use Bang Bang. Uh, number three, we're going to choose which pieces of domain logic we want to export using Expand Chain. And then finally, we will present the code to the user uh, using this, uh, this family of, of um, zip generating functions. Uh, just acknowledge some things that uh, Shiny Meta does not currently do or doesn't do well, uh, and things that we hope to improve. Uh, currently, Expand Chain does not introduce variables for input values and for reactive values. Um, and that's not as bad as, uh, as the, the limitations of with meta mode today, but it would sure be nice if Expand Chain at least had the option to hoist input values as variables at the top of your code so that you could easily customize them. That's something that does not currently work with Expand Chain. Uh, the formatting of the code that we generate out of Shiny Meta, it does not look like the original code that you typed. Uh, we lose white space, um, and uh, some you know, indenting and stuff like that is lost when R parses your code. Uh, but we have ideas of how we can make that better in the future. Uh, probably um, most seriously, it's not compatible at all right now with Shiny Async. Uh, I don't think that it's insurmountable, but um, it, it's just, it increases the degree of diff difficulty by a lot. So we are hoping to make Shiny Meta stable before we take that step. And uh, finally, sort of more fund fundamentally, this approach, we're really only talking about taking uh, reproducible snapshots of an app's state, uh, where you've gone through some process and who cares about the process you got through to get to a result, and now you want a reproducible way to generate that result. That is useful, but there is another mode of working uh, which is also, also useful, where you want to preserve all the steps and missteps that you took along the way in order to get at the uh, final outcome. And it, currently, Shiny Meta uh, is, is not designed for that. Um, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Adrian Waddell at Roche Genentech, who um, really opened my eyes to the uh, possibility of metaprogramming being a way to solve this reproducibility problem. Um, he's doing really great work with this framework called Teal, which unfortunately uh, has not been open sourced yet. <laughs> hint, hint. Um, thank you also to uh, Doug Kelkoff, who's coincidentally also at Roche Genentech, uh, for working on Script Gloss, which uh, while we ended up taking a different approach, um, being able to examine his ideas uh, and, and sort of um, look at the, the choices that he made really uh, provided a valuable counterpoint as we were thinking through our own design decisions. And finally, I want to acknowledge all of the intrepid Shiny users who, uh, without any help or support from me or, or my team, have solved this problem themselves in uh, increasingly ingenious ways over the years. Um, some of you, I think, are in this room. And um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm sorry that I was not able to provide help sooner. I am hopeful that Shiny Meta can make this uh, a little bit easier for you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for a uh, few questions. Uh, I saw, uh, no, 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 no. Yes, maybe this one. How does Shiny Meta works with Shiny modules? Um, it does work with modules, amazingly. Um, and really, uh, I wasn't sure it would until Friday of last week. Uh, Currently, the way it works with modules, I didn't get into this, but the way expand chain, uh, well, sorry, let me take one step back. The problem with modules is um, it introduces a new namespace. Uh, I mean, well, 
It's weird to say that that's the problem. That is the feature of modules. It introduces a new namespace. Um, but what a namespace, uh, what a namespace does is it lets you have two copies of a variable that you as a human can think of as having the same name, and yet they stay distinct. Uh, they are differentiable by the system. So one of the big challenges with Shiny Meta is if we have two variables floating around, two meta reactives floating around that ostensibly have the same name, how can we include them in the same script without them kind of pounding over each other? The current approach that Shiny Meta takes is to take the ID of the module instance and prefix the uh, variable name with that and an underscore. So if you call a module twice within um, a Shiny server function, uh, you are required by Shiny modules to provide uh, a unique identifier for each of them. It doesn't have to be global unique, globally unique, but from that, that part of your code, it has to be unique. Um, and when we looked at actual instances of where you would use modules, it, it actually is a pretty natural prefix to use. So for example, if um, you, know, you are using the same inputs on two tabs of your app, but on one tab they're, they're called, uh, you know, this is a summary tab, and on another one you have a plot tab, and in both of those modules you have the same uh, you know, x variable, then it would become plot underscore x and summary underscore x. So that's how Shiny Meta works today. It will uh, disambiguate variable names um, from modules using the module ID. Uh, we have thought about um, a lot of the times when we use modules, we might be only using a module once, in which case it's not even necessary to use the prefix. And uh, that, that is something uh, we are considering supporting. But so far, um, I've been surprised how well it works already with modules. Um, that being said, this is all very new stuff. So if you try this yourself with your modules and you find that something doesn't work, uh, definitely let me know, and uh, I'll be happy to take a look. Oh, new question. Uh, does your package affect the performance of the Shiny app? Um, you know, it affects it in theory. Um, really, there, there is so little that's happening when you are not in meta mode. So the normal mode where you're just running reactively, running a normal interactive app, it does go through an additional function call, but that cost is so vanishingly small compared to the work that you're probably doing inside of a reactive. So um, I'm going to say probably not. Um, I will say that currently, um, when you build your RMDs, that currently is being done synchronously. So I will say if you have a Shiny app that otherwise is not that expensive to run, and suddenly all of your users are generating PDFs in the background, uh, and those are holding up the main R thread, then uh, that is something that you'll definitely want to keep an eye on. Uh, but in the future, we should be able to take that code and move it uh, using futures onto a separate process. So the, the goal is for this really not to affect the performance of Shiny very much at all. And uh, you know, to be honest, most of the questions that I get about the overhead of features that we build that come as uh, part of Shiny um, Usually it's your code that's slow, to be honest. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you are using this stuff and believe that uh, there is a performance problem introduced, definitely run it under uh, the profits profiler and see if that's indeed the case. So. Um, next question. How does documentation work when... <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's nice. <laughs> How does... No. Okay. I will find I, I another... Got I got it. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, how, how does documentation work when we, uh, when we extract it to a, an RMD? Um, so uh, there are two things that this could be referring to. Uh, number one, if you are a very sophisticated, uh, savvy R metaprogramming person already, you may be aware that when R parses a piece of code, it actually immediately throws away the comments. So the um, meta reactives that I showed you, if you put a comment in there, when you extract the code out, the comment will be gone. Uh, so what we decided, I didn't mention it in the talk, but we introduced this um, concept called comment strings. And the way, um, can I exit this for a second? I'll just, um, oh, French keyboard. Point. This is going to be awesome, guys. 
Why am I, why am I trying to do this? This is, no, never mind. I'm out, I'm out. Um, uh, okay, so what you can do is you take your comment and just surround it by double quotes. So if you have a string that's on a line by itself and it begins with a pound sign or a hashtag for you younger folks, um, that will be interpreted as a comment, and when, when the code is rendered, it'll appear like a comment. Uh, you know, when I first, I think Hadley came up with that idea, and at first I was like, ugh, and then when I actually looked at what it looks like, you like visually almost forget that it's not a comment, so it works pretty nicely. The other thing that someone might be asking, the, the intent behind this question might be, um, in an RMD, we put a lot of narrative documentation, right? The whole point of RMDs is to let you put your narrative next to your source code and outputs. And in that sense, uh, this approach is no, no different than a normal RMD. If you have narrative that you want to hard code to kind of explain what the intent of a plot is or something like that, you can just write that directly in your .rmd template, and that's fine, it'll just be rendered. Uh, if you want to be a little fancier and have dynamic text, uh, you, you don't want to hard code that text, but you actually want the text to be responsive to certain features that you see in the data or in your analysis. Uh, you can do that as well using that double uh, curly bracket, uh, curly brace uh, approach and just pass those strings in. So um, it's not as transparent, all this is not quite as transparent as I would like, but I think you should hopefully be able to achieve everything that you want to in terms of code documentation. Um, which one? Which question? Uh, yeah, we can do the first, first one. one. First one. Is shiny producing a larger gap between us, the actual air user, and them, the shiny point-to-click user? Should we encourage them to learn? Yes. Uh, yes. Sure, we should encourage them to learn. Why not? Uh, <laughs> no, in, in honesty, uh, it's definitely true. Shiny makes it easy for us, us to make these accessible artifacts that um, that saves people from having to learn R. And uh, for sure, that is a double-edged sword. Uh, there's no question that it's a double-edged sword. Um, but that trade-off, I think, is worth it for a lot of people. Um, I mean, the kinds of things that people are building with Shiny really run the gamut from things that you might use R to do and things that you would never do in a, in a million years if you, if you were not already an R user. Um, you know, one of the first Shiny apps that I can remember was a, um, a fantasy football draft. Well, that maybe doesn't mean anything in Europe. Uh, you, you could, uh, I've seen people build like recipe books, you know, using Shiny, and that's just like their unconventional uses of R. But I will say that uh, I am very sympathetic to this point that we, we would like to have more and more and more people learn how to code and learn how to code in R. That is the thesis of R Studio as a company. Uh, there's a reason why so little of what we do involves uh, point and click stuff and not coding. And I actually think that Shiny Meta is a step in that direction because it helps, this, it helps create this bridge where even though you've created this interactive artifact, you are no longer at a greater remove from the original source code. This makes it possible for us to have this interactive thing and yet also lift up the hood and say, and here is the R code that does exactly the equivalent thing in your R Studio session. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this point and I'm hopeful that Shiny Meta is a step in the right direction. Uh, why the Shiny team use camel case but Tidyverse team use snake case? <laughs> <laughs> Did Hadley ask this? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, Shiny came first, thank you. Um, no, so, so to be honest, um, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Shiny started in 2012, and it was, I think, literally weeks before Hadley came on board at our studio. Um, and uh, really, if the timing was a little different, maybe things have, would have gone a different way. But at the time, it was basically just me and JJ, and JJ Lair, the founder of uh, our studio. And you know, this was not a question we took lightly, like which convention should we take? And um, I will say at the time, neither of us really knew anything about the domain. We, we were both very excited about ours potential, but we, um, 
I'll say we were very humble in our approach. We did not want to uh, impose a lot of our opinions on people because those imp opinions were not well informed. So uh, really what, the reason we ended up with camel case is because we looked at uh, base R, and base R has a lot of different you know, conventions uh, that they've used over time, but we looked at what are the most recent conventions that have been going into base R. The newest functions in base R, what convention are they using, and it was camel case. Uh, so, you know, I mean, w would it be snake case if we started it today? I don't, maybe. I mean, I did come from a Java world originally, so. Um, yeah, ultimately these things, uh, they bother me a lot less than they bother a lot of other people, including Hadley. So, um, you know guys, it's interactive web apps with R. Aren't you just happy that it works? Come on. <laughs> so we have time for two more questions, if you're okay. Uh, how does Shiny Meta integrate effects governed by JavaScript? Um, yeah, I should have put that on my limitations slide, yeah. So yes, this, that is a really excellent point. Um, this sort of, um, this is sort of a recurring theme, I think, with uh, some of these tools that we've been building around Shiny, is that stuff that happens in JavaScript is at such a remove from the R process that, um, it is difficult for us to recreate those sorts of conditions. So I will say that what Shiny Meta gives you is the ability to reproduce your analysis to the degree that it's represented in the state of the R process. Uh, wow, that really sounded like lawyer speak. That was <laughs> so many caveats. Uh, what it basically means is the server's view of the world is what it can reproduce. So if you have taken your Plotly plot and you've zoomed in and you've selected these three points and there are tooltips showing, and then you hit download code, those things are just not gonna be uh, represented in the output. That is actually a really good point, and thank you for bringing that up, whoever that was. Um, is it overloading the bang bang? What if I need to use it in a tidyverse context? Yeah, so uh, in a sense it is overloading bang bang. This is a really great question. Um, so. Uh, as, if I understand this question correctly, what if you need to put a bang bang uh, into the code that's being generated? And um, I didn't really fully get into, uh, you know what? I have a um, uh, French keyboard. Um, my team made me cut these slides. They said it wasn't interesting. Um, <laughs> So I talked about, <laughs> I wanted to talk about what is metaprogramming, and I just want to point out that uh, this is regular code. When you execute it, it gives you a data frame. This is code that's quoted as a string. So when we, when we run it, no dplyr code runs. Instead, you just get a bunch of characters in memory, right? Uh, and when you uh, use the quote operator, which, I mean, you don't see it in Shiny Meta, but this is what's happening under the hood, uh, you end up with code that is, you know, something like this. And the reason I bring this up now is to say, um, let's say you have a string that you're using double quotes to delimit. How do you express double quotes within that double, quote, double quoted string? Uh, and the answer is you have another level of quotes. They're escaped, uh, so you put backslash and double quote. And the equivalent of doing that in, uh, in this sort of metaprogramming, tidyverse sort of world is you put another set of bang bangs inside of your bang bang, and the equivalent of backslash is the quote. You know, if this keyboard wasn't French, I would show you, but uh, we'll, we'll add something to the documentation to, to make it clear how to do that. So it, it is possible, but it is ugly in the same way that expressing double quotes inside of a string literal is ugly, so. How do we avoid copying a big object like full data sets with the bang bang operator or copying in the same object multiple times? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. 
Um, maybe it is slower with Shiny Meta. <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> I told you this stuff is very new. Um, no, so uh, that, that, that is a really good question. Um, we'll have to look at that. It does, it, when, I think what this person's alluding to is uh, when you run this in sort of, uh, you know, full speed uh, interactive mode, that bang bang operator does exist. It is, it is going to expand. Um, so yeah, that is, that is a good question. Um, yeah, I don't currently know. It does seem like that could potentially, potentially be a problem. So that's a, that's a really great one that we'll investigate. And maybe the last question. Uh, expansion is really elegant. Could you expand more on the thinking that brought this as your solution to ugly code? Oh, uh, I would love to. I am so excited about expand chain. Um, I hesitate to even tell you how ugly the code was that came before. It was really, really bad. Um, the, the basic... Uh, sorry, I have not thought at all about how to express this to anyone. I thought a lot about what I said in my presentation, but I, um, I didn't think I'd be talking about this. What we did before, you can actually see the source code. We didn't have time to remove it before this talk. So there are two functions in there. One is called expand objects, and one is called expand code. And they are both terrible. Um, expand code, uh, what you would basically do is you would write uh, an expression that has all of the objects that you care about. Um, and not just saying, like, I want this output, but you would have to also indicate all of the dependencies that are necessary for that output to be rendered. So you would have to list all the reactives, basically, uh, that were relevant to your app. And then we had a way to basically, oh my gosh, um, as we're evaluating that, that code, we would basically insert uh, objects into the environment that those meta reactors would execute in. Um, there was this idea of dynamically scoped variables that used to be popular in programming languages before computer scientists knew better. Um, and we basically brought that back despite knowing better. Uh, so there was a feature called dynamic variables, and we would basically force you as the author of the Shiny app to, um, the technical term is to monkey patch. You would monkey patch these values as expand code was running. It, I mean, it was terrible. There's a lot of code duplication. I mean, everything about it was terrible. Uh, the breakthrough that allowed Expand Chain to be so elegant is to realize that the only thing that really makes sense to bang bang are reactive values and reactive expressions, uh, these meta reactive expressions. And because we know that all the code that could lead to this ugly expansion, all is going to come through this one place in the code, that's a great place for us to add a hook. So what we added was an environmental hook right at the place where a meta reactive is being, uh, being called for its code. And uh, it says, if someone wants to know, I am being called. Here is my object. And if you want to generate my code the normal way, here's where that code is. And expand chain before it actually goes and fetches the objects you pass to it. Uh, it installs a hook, so it starts listening and intercepting any calls to meta reactives. And instead of returning the code, it returns the variable name. And that's all it needs to do. So everywhere you wanted to expand your call to a meta reactive, the only thing you get back is the symbol name for that meta reactive. And that also gives us the opportunity to know what variables currently exist? What variables have we introduced, and therefore we cannot use that same variable name? So we can uh, disambiguate variable names, uh, and we can notice that we're in a module, so we need to add a prefix to that. It, it's exactly the right place to make all the kinds of decisions we need to make in order to generate uh, the right kind of code. Uh, and, I mean, just because of the, the, um, the way that it's called, it inherently linearizes this complex graph of um, of meta reactives into uh, what's called a, topo a topologically sorted list. It, it happens automatically. There's no sorting code there. It's just, it, it's, it just sort of is an inherent property of, of how this, I feel like I'm talking basically to myself at this point, but I'm really excited about it. It is so great. Uh, and the, the end result not only generates the best code of any of the approaches that we took so far, uh, but it is also the most maintainable and gives us the most uh, options for enhancing it in the future. So. Uh, but yeah, it's open source, so if you want to look at it, you can. So thank you very much.
Joe for this uh, amazing presentation.